I don't know about you guys, but I'm not a big fan of Time Change Sorry. Sunday. What's up, man? <laughs> oh, that's What's going good on, to see you, man? Oh. I haven't been here. Can you see? I got my ears lowered a little bit. Just push down. Just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Just I, I a little it. bit of a high fade. I love it. That's it. <laughs> it's good to see you, brother. God bless you. Um, man, I am not a fan of this time change. So first of all, like my voice isn't all, well, I, I digress. My voice is always all there. I'll, I'll fight through not being able to talk all that well. But we had a great hockey game last night. We won 7-2, to so there's lots of shouting, lots of, you, you know, chirping going on. Um there's a guy to the right of the section. Vanessa's in our section with Leslie and I. She's a few rows up. And, and there's a guy off to our right-hand side that is taunting the opponent's goalie the whole game. Uh -huh. So the way hockey works is, is they, they, they go one way, then they switch sides, and then they, and then they come back. So for two periods in the section that we sit at, uh, we get the opponent's goalie on our end, and there's a guy off to the right of us that taunts the goalie the whole game. And so he'll shout something to the goalie, and then our response, we kind of respond to that with taunting that I, I really don't want to share from the pulpit, but if you know, you know, okay? Um, nothing, we're not saying bad words, I promise. That's not what this is about. But uh, if you've been there, you know uh, a little bit of taunting, but... but we won 7-2, so like my voice was, is kind of shot from, from last night. I woke up this morning, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's church. I gotta, you know, I gotta get over this. You know, I've been kind of drinking water all morning long. But, um, and then you add to that, like the time change thing. So, so you guys know, I've, I've kind of shared, I'm usually rolling around between like 3, 30, 4 o'clock. I'm, I'm, I'm getting up, I'm coming out here and, and doing my thing. But we get home last night, I think around 8.45, 9 o'clock. And in my mind, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's already 10 o'clock. Yeah. Because my mind is already an hour ahead thinking that it's 10 o'clock. I'm two hours past my bedtime. I'm going to pay for it tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. So then I wake up this morning and... I look over my, I, I, well, we have a little digital clock that has to be manually changed. I look at that and, and it only said 315. And in my mind, in the moment, I'm like, oh, cool. I'm just going to close my eyes again. Maybe I'll get another hour and then I'm going to get up and get going because I was tired. And then I look at the digital clock and I roll over and I, my phone is right next to, you know, on the nightstand right next to my head right there. I look at that and it's, and it says 415 and I'm like, oh, bro. I was not vibing this morning, man. But I laid there because out. I just <laughs> refused to get up. I, and so I didn't get, I, I like to work out in the morning. I didn't get a chance to do that this morning. But we're here and it's time change. You just got to deal with it, man. You just got to deal with it. I'll probably nap later. There's nothing like a good Sunday afternoon nap, in my personal opinion. Uh, my kids, they don't nap, but I nap. They can hear me snoring through their doors. It's okay. Um... Ephesians chapter 3, as we continue this series, Who Am I? We see a lot of things used that sort of set forth the identity of not only us as believers in this chapter, but as I'll point out right from the get-go in verse number 1, how Paul identifies himself in Christ Jesus. And um, it, it's, it's a position that... I, I hope and that I pray one day I can faithfully say about who I am in Christ Jesus that I am who Paul was in Christ Jesus. And you'll see a specific word there in verse number one to know what I'm talking about. Um, let me read with you the first seven verses of Ephesians chapter 3. And then, uh, and then we're going to get going in our sermon this morning. Paul says this in verse number one. For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote aforetime in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, 
and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Church family, pray with me. Father God, I I come before you uh, this morning, Lord God, once again without notes, uh, once again, Father God, solely relying on you, uh, Lord, to speak through me and to use me, Lord, for your glory and for your honor, Lord. I pray that as we read the scriptures this morning, this third chapter of the epistle that Paul wrote to the Ephesian church, that, Lord God, you would open our minds, open our hearts to receive what it is that needs to be received by you this morning. Father God, that you would move me aside, move my own personal agenda, move, Lord God, my own personal thoughts aside, my own ways, my own desires aside this morning. And Father God, establish your will in my life, Lord God. Settle your ways in my life, Lord God, and go before me, guiding my path, making my way straight, that I may minister to this church family that is here before me this morning, Lord, and that I may encourage them through the scriptures, Father. I give you all the glory and all the honor this morning, asking, Father, once again, that your Holy Spirit would just move amongst us today. I ask and pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. When I think of this idea of being a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, you sort of have some preconceived notion of, well, okay, well, what does it mean to be a prisoner? Well, for, for a lot of reasons, you're, you're shackled or you're bound. Uh, when, when you're in prison, you're, you're, you're sort of bound to the walls with, within that prison. You can't go outside of that. Uh, uh, you're, you're shackled, so to speak. Maybe, maybe not necessarily physically, but you certainly are mentally, emotionally shackled at times in, in, in prison as well. It, 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 it oftentimes means that you have had to surrender to the justice system, the legal system, the court system um, as penalty for something that was done in your life. So how does that translate to being a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, in, in like manner, it, it, it translates it with the idea that, that we are bound to Christ Jesus, right? We are bound to, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are shackled, if you will, to the word of God and, 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 and really what we should be doing, how we should be living our lives is within the walls or within the parameters of what the Holy Scriptures define living for you and I to be. And it's not that we are paying a penalty, unlike maybe the, the prisons of the society and the world that we live in. It's not that we are paying a penalty and have to be bound or shackled. Christ paid the penalty of sin for you and I, and thus we should have a desire to cleave to that, to be bound to that, to be shackled to that. You know, in, in other words, listen, shackle me to Jesus Christ and throw away the key. I don't want to see the key anymore. And, you know, throughout the movies, I love this. You know, there's there's a cop, there's a detective, or or there's a, there's a federal agent, and, and 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 what you see when they apprehend somebody, or they oftentimes maybe travel with prisoners. Every once in a while, you'll see that that they shackle themselves or they handcuff themselves to the prisoner so that he can't go anywhere. Or, or, or they, they, they handcuff themselves to whoever it is that they might be transporting or whatever the case is. I, I, I envision this idea of, man, I want to be handcuffed to Christ and, and, and throw away the key. I don't ever want to be let go of or released out of being handcuffed to Jesus Christ. Because when I'm handcuffed to Christ, when I'm bound to Christ, when I'm shackled to Christ... I'm as close to him as I can possibly get. He's literally right next to me. He can't go anywhere without me following, and I can't go anywhere without him following, and, and sometimes he's probably got to yank me back with, that, with, with those shackles. Solomon, that's not where I want you to go. I'm tugging you back or I'm yanking you back. That's the idea of being a prisoner of Jesus Christ. 
You're bound to him. You're shackled to him. You're surrendered to him. But Paul points out that he's a prisoner of Jesus Christ for the Gentiles. He's speaking to the church in Ephesus who were commingled with Jews and Gentiles alike. And whether those Gentiles were, were from, from Greece or from Turkey, from Asia Minor, wherever they had come from, if you weren't a Jew, by blood, you were a Gentile. That's just what it was. Whatever your nationality, whatever race you were, wherever you came from, if you were not Jewish, you were just a Gentile. There was a blanket assumption that if you weren't Jewish, you were Gentile. Paul says, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ for the Gentiles. I'm shackled to Christ Jesus for the, for, for the Gentiles. And then he, he says something rhetorical in verse number two. He says, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, you were, of course they've heard of it. Why? Because we, we read the first two chapters over the last couple of weeks. He's clearly shared with them the gospel of Jesus Christ, the grace of God. So he says something rhetorical. He says, if you have heard, and you have, the dispensation or the sharing of the grace of God, he says, which is given to me to give to you, he says, how that by revelation, he made known unto me the mystery. Let me stop there for a moment. Paul will reveal what the mystery is. As I mentioned a moment ago, there were commingled within the New Testament church many Jewish believers of Jesus Christ, as well as these Gentiles, right? And, and so the mystery, as Paul is going to reveal momentarily, was given to God, was made known unto Paul by God, and he is now sharing what this mystery is. He says, uh, as I wrote afore in few words, verse number four, whereby when you read or when ye read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And so Paul is, Paul is explaining, I'm sharing this with you so that when you read it, you will understand it. I was for lack of a better term, a very mediocre student in school. I can read something and not understand it. I can go through something and not understand it at all. But when somebody spoke to me about it, when somebody shared with me what it was about, then I could put the two together and understand it. Paul's not only saying, I spoke it to you before, but now you're going to read it so that when you go over it, now you'll understand it. He says in verse 5, which in other ages, Old Testament is what he's referring to. This mystery he's speaking of was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And so what Paul is saying is that, listen, in the Old Testament, the Old Testament saints, this mystery that I'm about to reveal, this thing that I'm about to share, was not known unto the sons of men in the Old Testament. He says, but now, now that Christ has ascended, that's why it can be revealed. He says, now it's been revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The word Spirit there in verse number 5 of Ephesians chapter 3 should be capitalized. It's a reference to the Holy Spirit. When Christ ascended, right, we know that he sent his comforter, the Holy Spirit. And now that we have the Holy Spirit, it is through the Spirit and it is by the Spirit that the mysteries of God are revealed to men. And herein lies the mystery in verse number six, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. There's one thing that we are. There's fellow heir. We're fellow heirs. He says, and of the same body, speaking of the body of the church, and he adds a third thing, partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So what's he saying? We have to put verses 5 and verses 6 together. 
What he's saying is this, is that the mystery, which is that the Gentiles would be fellow heirs and of the same body within the church and partakers of his promise in the Messiah by the gospel, that same promise that was given to the Jews is also the same promise given to the Gentiles. That's the mystery, is that the Gentiles are receiving the promises of God through the Messiah. For centuries, and, and even today, the Jews believe that the Messiah is a Jewish Messiah, and he is, but that salvation is solely for them. That it's not a gift to the Gentiles. That it's not meant for the Gentiles. To be called a Gentile in Jesus' day in Jerusalem was almost a curse word. Because it, went, it meant you weren't Jewish, and it meant that you were not worthy to receive the promises of God. Now, if you go throughout the Old Testament, if you read the Bible and study it, there are many places in the scriptures where God talks about the promise being given to the Gentiles. That in the end, the Gentiles would turn to God. It's all over the Old Testament. But was, what, what wasn't revealed at that time is the how. Jesus is the how. And Paul is now stating that that mystery, that thing that nobody knew about in the Old Testament, we knew it when there was something. But now that we know what it is in Christ Jesus, Paul says this is the mystery. That in Christ or because of Christ, the Gentiles also are going to be fellow heirs. To a Jew to be a fellow, for a Gentile to be a fellow heir with them is something completely foreign. It's a foreign concept. They don't think that, that we're worthy. But Paul says, no, the Gentiles are fellow heirs with you. And he says, and of the same body. The church collectively is made up of Jewish believers and Gentile believers. Right? The church in the New Testament being the bride is made up of everyone that would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, both Jew and Gentile. He says, and partakers of the promise. What's the promise? Everlasting life. Uh, again, something that Old Testament Jews, and, and again, even today, believe is only reserved for them, the partaker or the promise of everlasting life through the Messiah. Paul is revealing to us, revealing to the church that the Gentiles are receiving the same promise. And I love the last three words in verse number six. He says, by the gospel, we are fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ by the gospel by the good news, by the death, by the burial, and by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ did it for all of us, not just some, not just a select group, not just a, a select race, not just a select body. He did it for all of us. The gospel is for everyone. It covers everyone, and it covers everything. And then Paul says in verse 7, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. One thing that I'm always reminded of in the ministry is that whatever gifts I bring up here, whatever gifts of wisdom, whatever gifts of knowledge, whatever gifts of understanding, whatever gifts of teaching or preaching that I have is solely by the grace of God. I, believe me when I tell you, I'm an unlearned man. I, I have gone to no fancy schools. I have not studied one minute any theological course or class that is offered from any university, online or otherwise, all I have done is read the scriptures and solely relied on God's grace to get me to where I am today. 
It's not of my own doing. I am not smart enough and I am not good enough and I am not wise enough to be doing what I am doing. I, I, folks, believe me when I tell you I'm not. Paul says, I was made a minister according or by the gift of grace that has been given to me by the working of God's power. It's, 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 it's solely by God's power. I'm not up here on my own volition. I'm not up here on my own strength. I'm not up here on my own power. I'm up here solely relying on the strength of God and on the power of God and on the grace of God to get me through whatever it is that he has called me to do or asked me to do in this ministry. And he goes on to say in, in verse number eight, and, 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 and this is again just something fascinating about Paul. He says, unto me, this is kind of piggybacking off of verse seven, who am less than the least, of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Paul always put himself in a position of being less than the least of all saints or, or even calling himself the chief among all sinners. Paul said, I'm the greatest of all sinners and I'm, I'm less than the least of the saints. If we do not approach our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ with this attitude and with this mentality right here, we are of no benefit to the kingdom of God. We are of no benefit to the kingdom of God. We have to so separate ourselves from the life that we think we should live and, and fully surrender to this idea that I am less than the least of the, of the saints. Now, God is no respecter of persons. There, there is an even playing field when it comes to the kingdom of God and what he believes in his saints. But it, if there was a pecking order, you know, let's call Moses number one. Let's give David number the number two spot. Right? Maybe we can throw in an Isaiah, Jeremiah there. We've got Peter's up there. Paul's up there. The, the, the apostles are up there. Let's just say hypothetically there was a pecking order. And then all the way down at the bottom, you have the very last guy. This, but he's a saint. But you have the very, Paul says, I'm less than that guy. That is the attitude and that is the approach that we must have when it comes to our relationship with Jesus Christ and even more importantly on how we express ourselves to the world in our relationship with Jesus Christ. If we do not humble ourselves, if we do not bring ourselves to a position of being less than the least of them, we will never be of benefit to the kingdom of God, especially to a broken and lost world that solely thrives off being the greatest, being the best, being puffed up, being filled with pride. We must approach it being less than the least of all the saints. And Paul is continuously, I think, astonished as I am at times, that he's even been chosen to do what he's done. He says that I should preach among the Gentiles. Again, this grace has been given to me that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. In other words, who am I to be doing this? Who am I that is less than the least of them that has been given this grace to preach to the Gentiles? the unsearchable riches of Christ. Folks, we, we, we may have an idea about the riches of Christ. And, and, and again, my, my mind, I, I can think that big, I, you know, and have this idea about what are the riches of Christ. But Paul says that they're unsearchable. The riches of Christ are unsearchable. Just when you think you've found the riches of Christ Jesus and, and it's phenomenal and it's good and it's awesome, you realize that there's more out there. 
There's things about Christ that are just unsearchable because he's that good. Because he's filled with that much love. And he says also, speaking about how he should preach the unsearchable riches of Christ in verse 9, he says, and also to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, the mystery that I was speaking about a moment ago, that Jews and Gentiles are of the same fellowship, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Christ Jesus. As I mo mentioned a moment ago, right, these things were hidden. They were hidden in the Old Testament. They were there, but they were hidden in the Old Testament. There were uh, uh, bits and pieces throughout the Old Testament. Hey, the Gentiles will turn to God, but they were hidden. But now in Christ Jesus, they've been revealed. And Paul says, who created all things, all these things that, that have been revealed have been created by Jesus Christ. For what purpose? Verse 10 tells us, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. This verse right here, verse number 10, had me stuck. What is he talking about? Under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. And here's what I've come up with. I don't believe that even the angels knew what God's plan was in Christ Jesus. I believe that when, when, when Christ was born, when Christ lived, when Christ died and he ascended up to heaven, when the church was established, this was something new and something revealed to even the angels in heaven. I believe that they were probably up there going, how is God going to do what he said he's going to do? And then when Christ died, when Christ was, was resurrected, when the church was established, the aha moment came on with the angels. And it was even revealed to them under the principalities and the powers in the heavenly places. It was revealed to them through the establishment of the church, Jesus Christ being the head of the church and the church body. They now know, even they know the manifold wisdom of God now. Again, it says that it was a mystery. It was something that was hid from the beginning of the world. And this verse is implying that it was even hid from the angels. But now it's been revealed. The manifold wisdom of God has been revealed in the establishment of the church. And again, it's a church that consists of the fellowship of the mystery. We are all of one accord under the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in verse 11, according to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whom, folks, this is what I want to hone in on for a moment here in whom we have boldness, there's one thing, and access with confidence by the faith of him. In other words, what Paul is saying, that in Christ Jesus our Lord, we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. One of the gifts that we have been given, as Paul says here, is this gift of boldness and confidence because of our faith. And I think that, that it is a gift that, like many other gifts, are not used the way that they need to be used, nor are they used as frequently as we should be using them. Think about this for a moment. The gift of boldness. Uh, m many times in, in my walk with the Lord, I, I have lacked boldness. I have lacked confidence because I didn't trust myself. 
not realizing at the time that it wasn't about me. It was about the boldness and the confidence that I have by my faith. So what does that say about my faith if I lack boldness and confidence? That my faith is lacking. That's exactly what that says. But if I have faith in God, if I believe in God, that should empower me or embolden me and give me the confidence that I need to do and to carry out what it is God has given me to do and to carry out. That, that's why Paul writes in, in Hebrews 4.16 to come boldly before the throne of grace. Why? Because of our faith in Jesus Christ. We have a tendency to have boldness that the gospel of Jesus Christ is true. I am bold in the reality that Jesus Christ went to the cross. I am bold in the reality that he was resurrected, that the tomb is empty. I am bold in the reality that I have been given eternal life because of what Jesus Christ did through the gospel. But boy, am I a little wimp when it comes to, boy, am I going to be able to pay my bills tomorrow? Or, man, I just don't know what tomorrow is going to bring her. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm worried about... Uh, I'm worried about a sprinkler. So how's my sprinkler system in the, in the house going to get fixed? Or I've got a hot water heater going out. I'm telling you, folks, we, we, we have boldness when it comes to trusting God with our eternal souls. And yet we have no faith when it comes to the daily life challenges that we face. What does that say about our, our faith and our boldness in God? I think oftentimes it speaks volumes and sometimes it's some speaking that I don't want to speak about. We, we can all sit here and testify about how bold we are in our relationship with Jesus Christ and how much we believe, how confident we are by our faith in Christ Jesus. But we struggle with the here and now in the world that we live in. Right in the world to come, in the spiritual world, man, I, bro, I will go to battle in my boldness. But in the emotional world, in the mental world, in the physical world that we occupy right now, we lack that boldness. We lack that confidence. And 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 I ask why? Where's our faith? Paul says in verse 13, wherefore, or because of this, he says, because of the boldness that you should have in Christ Jesus, because of the access that you have, the confidence that you have by faith in Christ Jesus, Paul says in verse 13, wherefore, I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Paul was writing this letter from a Roman prison. No doubt it casts a heavy burden on the Ephesian church, on the Philippian church, on the Corinthian church, on the Colossian church. It cast a big burden on them when Paul was thrown into prison. They were worried. They struggled with doubt. They had fears. They lacked boldness. They lacked confidence when Paul the Apostle was thrown into prison. For his faith, by the way. For preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. That's why Paul was thrown into prison. And Paul says, listen, you have boldness. You have access with confidence by faith to God. He says, so because of that, don't worry about me. Don't worry about me. Don't worry about my tribulations. Don't worry about my struggles. Church family, I would tell you right now, standing before you, if I was ever thrown in jail for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, don't worry about me. God's going to take care of me. He has taken care of saints throughout the centuries that have been thrown into prison because of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I will not be an exception in the kingdom of God. I promise you this. None of you would. Don't worry about me. I would implore you, as Paul said in verse 12, have boldness. 
have access by confidence, with confidence, by the faith of Jesus Christ. Paul is telling the Ephesians, don't worry about me. You have everything you need to carry forward. My goal with this ministry is if what if it would ever end, if it would ever stop, if we ever were put into position where we cannot meet anymore, you have what you need to keep going forward in your faith in Jesus Christ. That you've been given the boldness that you've been given the confidence that you need to know what you've got to do to keep moving forward in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Folks, this, if, if I may, this is the cherry on top when we get to fellowship on Sunday mornings. Everything else, the bowl and then the ice cream put in and then, and then the, I, mean, I like caramel and chocolate drizzle on mine and then the whipped cream, that all comes to us Monday through Saturday. We're filling our spiritual bowl. We should be in reading God's word and in praying in boldness and having confidence by faith so that when we get here on, on, on Sundays, man, I'm just sprinkling the cherry on top. I'm putting the rainbow sprinkles over the top of the Sunday and we're just enjoying it. That's what I want church to be for y'all. You can leave here in boldness and in confidence in your faith that you have what you need to have in order to get out onto the streets of this world and live the life that Christ would have you live. If you're not getting that, come see me because I'm failing somewhere. But that's what I desire for you, that you can leave here emboldened in your faith from what you get here. But that it's just, it's just an added piece to the already faith and boldness and confidence that you're getting in your own personal time with the Lord. What we see in this last set of verses and beginning at verse number 14 is a prayer that Paul is going to pray to the Ephesians. He says, for this cause in verse number 14, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. I want to share with you really quickly. If, if you have your Bibles with you, jump forward two books of the Bible. After Ephesians is Philippians, and after Ephesians, or excuse me, after Philippians is Colossians. Go to Colossians chapter 1 for me really quickly. Paul is opening chapter 1, sharing about the preeminence of Christ in and around verse number 15. He's speaking of Jesus here. In verse number 15, he says about Christ, who is the image of the invisible God. Jesus Christ, folks, is the image of the invisible God. John says that God is spirit. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. That's why he writes that Christ is the image of the invisible God. He says the firstborn of every creature. He says, for by him, in verse 16, by Jesus, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Jesus and for Jesus. And verse number 17, and he, Jesus, is before all things, and by Jesus, all things consist. Church family, as we go back to Ephesians, literally everything that you see was created by Jesus Christ, and all things remain today or consist today because of Jesus Christ. Without Christ, we have nothing. Without Christ, there is nothing. And so when Paul says in verse number 15 of Ephesians chapter 3, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, we are named in Christ Jesus. 
When your parents named you, they might as well have named you Wes in Christ Jesus Cole. Solomon in Christ Jesus Stewart. My name, your name, our names are in Christ Jesus because he's created it all. He's created you. He's created me. We are in Christ Jesus. When God created man and woman, he says, let us create them in our image. We were created in the image of God and of Christ Jesus. Our very DNA is embedded in Christ Jesus. Being the firstborn, Paul says, amongst men in Colossians. He says in verse 16 as he begins his prayer, he says that he, speaking of Christ, would grant you, give you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. One thing I desire in my walk with the Lord is that I would be strengthened in my spirit. That the inner man, my very soul, my very being would be strengthened in the Holy Spirit. Why? As, as much as I can sit here and say, well, I care about my body and I exercise and I want to get physically strong. What? That's irrelevant. Where I am my weakest is in my own, in my own body, in my own mind, in my own heart. That's where we are all our weakest. And, and, and I pray for you and I pray for me as Paul is praying for the people at the church of Ephesus that we would be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Paul's not saying, oh yeah, you know, go, go get physically strong. Go, go run races, go lift weight. He goes, no, I pray that you are mighty in the spirit of God, inside, in your heart, in your mind. He says in verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, being rooted and grounded in love. May I just pause here for a moment in verse number 17. Did you know, and this is some little Bible history for you, this is the only mention in the Bible that Christ dwells in our hearts. The only mention in the Bible is right here of Christ dwelling in our hearts. Now, you believe with your heart, right? The Bible says that in Romans 10, that you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth. But this is the only place in the Bible that talks about Christ dwelling in our hearts by faith. Being rooted and grounded in love. The very essence of the gospel of Jesus Christ is love. The very foundation of our faith this morning is love. The very basis in which we live our lives should be that of love. Paul says to the church, I pray that you are rooted and grounded in love. We will be no good for the kingdom of God if what we do is not rooted and grounded in love. The fruit of the Spirit. The first fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. Love. All the rest that follow. Joy, peace, patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. All those that follow afterwards must be rooted and grounded in love. 
He also prays in verse 18 that you may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. Paul is speaking of the glory of God. He says, I want you to be able to comprehend with all the saints just how big God is. The breadth the breadth of God, the, the width of God's grace, the width of God's glory, the length of God's glory, the depth of God's glory, the height of God's, God's glory. Church family, let me share with you this morning that it's endless. It's vast. It's unsearchable. As unsearchable as the riches of Christ are that Paul spoke about in verse number eight, so is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height of the knowledge and understanding and glory of God. That's just how big of a God we serve. He says, and to know, of the, he's praying for us to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. I, I ask you this morning, do you truly know the love of Christ? All of us have heard about the love of Christ. All of us have probably read about the love of Christ. But do you truly know the love of Christ? Many have experienced the love of Christ and yet still do not know what it is. My, my question to you this morning is this. Do you know the love of Christ? Do you truly understand Christ's love for you? I had shared last week that the moment we begin to take our eyes off of the reality that we were once filthy wretches, lost in sin, the moment we take our eyes off of that, the cross of Christ begins to be diminished in our own lives. I believe to truly understand the love of Christ, to truly know the love of Christ, the only place that we need to be looking at is the cross of Calvary. Our eyes need to be fixated on the cross at Calvary. At the cross, therein lies the love of Christ, which passes any knowledge, any understanding, any wisdom. It's unexplainable. But to you and I, it is the greatest thing that we have ever been given. The love of Jesus Christ. And he closes it by saying that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. The fullness of God is, is Jesus Christ in our lives. That we might be filled with the fullness of God. We might be filled with the Holy Spirit. That we might be filled with the gospel. Having believed in our hearts having confessed with our mouths. As Paul said in verse 17, Christ dwelling in our hearts by faith. That's the fullness of God in you and I. And he closes with this benediction in verses 20 and 21. Now verse 20 is a very familiar verse. He says, now unto him, that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. You need to know this morning that you worship a God, that you praise a God, that you love a God that is able. If the verse just stop there. Now, unto him that is able. 
If it stopped right there, that's more than enough to explain what God can do. He is able. He's able to do whatever it is he wants to do. But Paul embellishes on that. He says, who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ask or think. Where does your faith lie today in Jesus Christ? Do you believe that he can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you can ever ask or think? The question is, if, if the answer is yes, that you believe God can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you would ever ask or think, I would ask you this question this morning. Have you asked him to do exceedingly and abundantly? Have you had the conversation with him to do exceedingly and abundantly? I, I think some pretty high and lofty thoughts about God and what I believe he can do. Again, he is able. You want to know where my challenge lies? In asking him to do exceedingly and abundantly. Part of that is because I don't feel worthy enough to ask him. I don't feel like I deserve any more than what he's already given me. As a matter of fact, I don't deserve what I have. And so to go to God and say, God, I need you to do exceedingly and abundantly above everything that I'm asking and thinking, boy, I, I, it comes off a little selfish. But why would Paul tell us that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ever ask or think if God is not willing to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ever ask or think. Why, why would this even be mentioned if God was not willing to say, Solomon, I'm waiting for you to ask me to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you can ever ask or think. Now, I'm waiting for you to ask me to do in your life exceedingly and abundantly all that you can ever ask or think. Have you stopped to think about that for a moment? The scriptures do say, by the way, you have not because you ask not. And when you ask, know that you have a God that is able, that he can perform it, that he can do it. Paul closes with this in verse 21. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages. He says, world without end. Amen. Paul closes down his prayer to the church at Ephesus in chapter number three, by giving glory to Jesus Christ in the church. I had shared with you guys a couple of weeks ago, this isn't the church. This is, you are, you're the church. That's the church. May God be glorified in you. Sure, I want God's blessings over the walls and the foundations of this house. But may God be glorified in you. May he be glorified in me. May he be glorified in Christ Jesus, in us, and what we do as the body of Christ. And he goes on to say, throughout all ages or for all eternity, world without end, he says. And I know, I read this and I'm like, well, what do you mean world without end? This world is going to end. Folks, let me remind you that we have been given the promise of a new world, a new heaven, and a new earth will, where Christ will be eternally glorified forever by its inhabitants. And Paul is reminding the church that unto God be the glory 
in the church, in the bride of Christ, by Christ Jesus for all of eternity in the world now and in the world that is going to come. Church family, be reminded this morning of the unsearchable riches of Christ Jesus. Be reminded this morning of the position that we all have in Christ Jesus. And I would implore you as well this morning to be reminded that God is able. What is it in your life that you need God to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you can ever ask or think? I challenge you this morning to ask, to pray, and to ask God, I need you exceedingly and abundantly above all that I can ever ask or think to do this in my life, Lord. Let your will be done. Church family, I pray that I am a prisoner of Jesus Christ this morning for your sakes. And I desire for you that you be a prisoner with me in the fellowship of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you so much for just these wonderful reminders throughout the book of Ephesians of of who we are, what our identity is, being fellow heirs and and Lord God, uh, 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 dwelling with the whole earth, the whole population, every color, every creed, every nation, every tribe, every tongue. I thank you that the gospel is an all-encompassing gospel for all that would place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, calling upon his name. And Father, I pray this morning that Christ would richly dwell in all of our hearts, that you would grow our faith, Lord God, that you would ignite our faith, Father God, setting it on fire to be the prisoners of the gospel of Jesus Christ for your glory and for your honor. Lord, I believe that every one of us has been called to be a prisoner to the gospel of Jesus Christ, Father. And I ask for the strength, not only for myself, but for this church family that is before me, for those that are online listening, for those, Lord God, that are going to listen later, that you would give them the strength, Lord God, to do what it is that you have called them to do, to be bound to you, to be shackled to the gospel, Lord God, to be handcuffed, if you will, to the word of God. And Father, I pray for those, Lord God, that need you to be able. Lord, we know that you're able, Father, but Lord, even more importantly, you are able to do far above, far beyond, exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ever ask or think, Lord. And so I pray that by faith, that Lord, we would cleave to that promise that you are able. And Lord God, whatever it is that is in our lives, Father, that we have been afraid to ask, that we have been challenged to ask, that we have neglected to ask because, Lord, thoughts of unworthiness, that Lord God, you would cast that aside. And Father, give us the confidence. Lord God, give us the hope that we need in you to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ever ask or think. Heavenly Father, thank you for the boldness by faith. Thank you for the access of confidence by faith that we have in Christ Jesus. Go before us and be glorified in us. I ask and pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.